James walked along the shore of Lake Erie while looking for driftwood. The Great Depression had made it difficult to make a living, but finding material to make stuff out of for free was one way of getting by. As he searched the beach, he saw something in the distance that looked a bit out of place. His curiosity got the best of him, and he began to head towards it. Was it a fish? No, the shape didn't look quite right. As he approached, his jaw dropped. He stared unbelievably at the torso of a woman amputated from the knees down. After rushing to the police station, they set up a search to find the rest of the woman. They found a few parts of her body scattered, but never located her head. On top of the dismemberment, they noticed her skin had been treated with a chemical turning it red and leathery. Unable to identify the body, the woman would be referred to as the Lady of the Lake by local newspapers. What the press and police didn't know was that a period of terror for Cleveland had just begun. I'm Rob Coakley, and this is Hometown Ghost Stories, Dark Mysteries, The Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. What's going on, everybody? Today, we are going to be talking about one of the craziest unsolved murders that has ever happened in the United States. It is the torso murders that happened in Cleveland in the 1930s, otherwise known as the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. This killer was never caught. So Kingsbury Run was a hobo jungle, is what many people called it, in the city of Cleveland during the Great Depression. In September of 1935, exactly about a year after the Lady of the Lake was found, two boys out playing would find the decapitated body of a man that was completely drained of blood. Not only was this body drained of blood, they also were emasculated. And if you don't know what emasculated means, it's when a part of a gentleman's body that only a gentleman would have no longer is there is the best way I can describe it in terms of what YouTube will allow me to say. Now, they were able to identify this body as Edward Andrassi, which is very rare for this case because as you'll notice, as we go along, most of these bodies were never identified. And the other thing they were able to determine with this one is that the method of death was actually decapitation, which is crazy to think of. Now, while they were searching the area after this body was found, they would stumble across another body that had been there much longer, at least a few more weeks, that had been decaying. They were never able to identify who this person was. However, he was also decapitated and emasculated with the cause of death also being decapitation. So this killer is really going at it and is establishing this method, which is a crazy one. And the other thing about this particular body is it had chemicals applied to it that turned its skin red and leathery, just like the Lady of the Lake. So there is a connection there, which is kind of important because the Lady of the Lake, it's unsure if she was part of this killing spree or not. So she's usually known as victim number zero, but it seems like it's kind of all adding up to me that they should be in the same category of the person who was doing this, but maybe not. Now, a woman walking her dog in January of 1936 was walking right by a factory when she saw some bushels that just seemed really out of place. Curiosity got the best out of her. And when she looked inside these bushels, she soon quickly wished she did not. What she ended up finding were parts of a woman's body wrapped up neatly inside of these bushels. Ten days later, the police would find the rest of this body in a vacant lot. Well, most of the body, they actually never recovered the woman's head. Now, unlike some of the other victims that we're going to talk about later, they were able to establish this victim's identity with fingerprints, and her name was Flo Palillo. Now, Flo's cause of death was also noted to be decapitation. The difference with this one, though, is that the killer waited a while before he dismembered the rest of the body, and rigor mortis had already set in. So he's kind of experimenting with what he wants to do for his kill ritual. In June of 1936, two boys playing in Kingsbury Run would come across the head of the next decapitated victim. And the way they came across this was there was something wrapped in a pair of trousers. And again, curiosity getting the best of people, 
They opened it up and boom, there was a face just staring right back at these two children. Must have been terrifying. Something that I never want to experience, to be perfectly honest. And the next day, the police would actually find the rest of this man's body completely intact. So he'd only been decapitated. What's really unique about this one is that they had identifying marks. He had six tattoos and this is the 1930s. Not many people other than sailors and criminals had tattoos. So you would think when you're able to show people these tattoos, that someone would have been able to identify who he was. And in fact, they put his head on display at a event that was happening in the city. And over 100,000 people came and saw the death mask of this man to see what he actually looked like. And there was no positive ID. They never discovered who he was. And he is often just referred to as the tattooed man in this case. Now, the death mask that they made of the tattooed man, as well as three others from this case, can be found at the Cleveland Police Museum to this day. In September of 1936, a man was running to try to hop onto a train, you know, little vagabond action that was going on back in the 1930s. And as he's trying to get to the train, he trips. And as you do, you're like, what the hell did I just trip over? And he looks down and he finds a torso on the ground on his path to this train. Now, of course, he alerted the police and the police came and there was a pool nearby, which had really just been turned into another form of a sewer. And the rest of the body was actually found and dug out of that quote unquote pool sewer. Now, this one's kind of important because although they had established that decapitation was the general form of murder in these crimes, this one, he decapitated the man, but also they determined that he did it in one single blow which is wild. And because of this, they established that he had a pretty good idea of anatomy, meaning he might've been like a butcher or a doctor. Now, at this point, the city of Cleveland is terrified and they are demanding that someone be found. They're demanding that this case get solved. People are, people are scared and rightfully so. You just, there's no rhyme or reason to this murderer. He's not doing what normal serial killers do. He's not killing just men or just women. He's taking whatever victim he can get and getting rid of them and all by decapitation. So the public is terrified. And the police department had put what they considered their best detective, Peter Morello, on the case. But the city demanded more and the mayor was feeling immense pressure. So the mayor turned to Elliot Ness, who had recently been named the Cleveland safety director. And this is the legendary lawman that took down Al Capone. You didn't think I was going to sneak an Al Capone reference in, but there it is. We got it. It's a hometown ghost stories must. The problem with this is that now two investigations were going on. We've talked about police departments that didn't talk to each other, and that's how serial killers were getting away with stuff. Now we had the detectives of this case, along with the safety director, doing their own public investigations, private investigations, and they're not sharing the information that they find with one another. It's almost like they didn't trust each other. And that's not going to help you catch who this person is. So it was like two separate people just doing their own thing. And the problem is, even after they started working on this case, the murders didn't stop. In February of 1937, a man walking on a beach would find a woman's torso washed up on the shore. Now, three months later, the rest of her body would wash up. The strange thing about this one is decapitation was not the cause of death. It didn't happen until after the woman was murdered. Again, No positive ID. You're going to hear that over and over and over again. In June of 1937, a boy out playing again. These kids in Cleveland are finding the craziest things. He finds a burlap sack. And within that burlap sack is a skull and bones. And this skull and bones would be determined to be that of a young black female, which also shows that this killer doesn't care about race. He doesn't care about gender. He is just killing who he can and experimenting on their bodies, essentially. Now, dental records would lead the police to believe that this victim was named Rose Wallace, the only other person in this entire thing that had been identified in some way, but it was never made a positive ID. So it's kind of give or take on if it actually was Rose Wallace. Now, in April of 1938, a man saw what he thought was a fish washed up on shore. And when he got closer, it ended up being the bottom half of a woman's severed leg. To which I say, this gentleman must not have done a lot of fishing, as I don't. And I probably would have made the same exact mistake. A search of the river would find more burlap bags and the rest of the woman within those burlap bags. 
And finally, on August 16, 1938, scrap collectors, they're just in this heap where people are known to dump things. They're looking for anything they can salvage out of it. They see this comforter that is wrapped up real nice. So they decide to unwrap it. And when they unwrap it, they look inside. And now there's a man's sport coat that is wrapped around something. And when they unwrap this, they actually find the remains of a woman within that. So the police come out and they start searching and they find this makeshift box. And within the makeshift box is the woman's head and her limbs. And that's not the only discovery they would make. As they're searching around, they actually come across another body. And the absolute craziest part about this is this area would have a direct view to Elliot Ness's office. So he could have looked out the window of his office and seen these two bodies it's almost like the killer was taunting Elliot Ness at this point. Now, two days later, looking for evidence is what he would say. Elliot Ness goes to Kingsbury Run and burns the entire thing down. He arrests like 60 to 70 men as well. He's questioning everybody. He ruins everybody's home. And he says that he's trying to keep them safe. They have to relocate now. And it's, dude, they're homeless. They're going to relocate around the streets. They're just as in danger as they were before except now you've burned all of their limited possessions. So not the greatest move by Elliot, Ma by Elliot Ness. Should be Elliot Ness. Just messed that up. But Elliot Ness, and it's a PR nightmare. And this is when his reputation begins to take a gigantic hit. In 1939, police would arrest Frank Dolezal. And the thing about Frank Dolezal is that he lived with Flo, victim number three or four, whichever one you want to go back to, depending on if you count the Lady of the Lake or not. And he also was sort of acquaintances with the other two identified victims. I do that in air quotes because one was positively identified, the other wasn't, Rose. So they're saying that he had a relationship with all three of these people. The problem is this was a real small community and they all drank in the same places and everyone kind of did know everybody. So you could kind of pin this on whoever you wanted to and say that they knew each other, right? Now, Frank would actually confess. However, his confession was filled with like wild ramblings, but then it would also have very specific key details, almost like he was coached into what he was saying. And law and the law and policemen and everything now will say, yeah, it seems as though he was kind of forced into this confession and told what to say. Now, Frank would actually hang himself in his cell before going to trial. And there was an autopsy done on his body and his entire body is bruised and broken. And he actually has six broken ribs showcasing what the police were doing to him in order to get this confession. And amongst all those that have studied the case all the way up until recently, no one really believes that Frank was the killer. So who was the killer? Uh, the craziest thing is that Elliot Ness believes he knows exactly who the killer was. Dr. Francis Sweeney actually lived near Kingsbury Run, and later in life, he would be diagnosed with severe schizophrenia. Ness was very suspicious of Sweeney, so much so that he actually held him illegally in a hotel for one to two weeks trying to get a legit confession out of him. And the problem with Sweeney being the killer is Ness could never get more than circumstantial evidence to convict him, so Sweeney stayed free. And the craziest part about this story is Sweeney would eventually check himself into a mental institution, and as soon as he checked himself into this mental institution, the murder seemingly stopped. And after this, like we said, Ness's reputation took a big hit. He was kind of lambasted in the public eye, and he would eventually die at a young age of 54 from a heart attack. But many believe that it was from drinking excessively, which is pretty interesting as he was the main lawman against prohibition at the time. And that's why he went after Al Capone in the first place. And I think this kind of shows that just because you were good at one part of a job where he was good at going after organized crime, doesn't make him the perfect candidate to go after a serial killer. Now, the craziest thing about the Sweeney theory is for the rest of Ness's life, Sweeney would send him letters and postcards that were cryptic and taunting, almost like the killer that left the bodies in the view of his office window. 
So that is the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run, one of the actual craziest serial killer stories we have here in the United States of someone that was never caught and apprehended. And myself, Dave, and Jesse are going to sit around and talk about this case. But what I want to know is, do you have any theories of who the killer was? Was it Dr. Sweeney? Was it Frank? Was it the same person that committed the Black Dahlia murder? We'll leave that dangling because that's going to be something we cover in the future. Anything that you think it was, throw it in the comments. Shoot us a message. Let us know. We can discuss it in the Discord. But right now, the three of us are going to talk about the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. going on everybody welcome into hometown ghost stories dark mysteries that was the voice of rob coakley covering the mad butcher of kingsbury run i'm dave wilkins i am joined by of course rob coakley what's up rob i don't want to sever your head but i do want to throw you in a pool sewer uh no i'd rather i think my head be severed (laughs) we're also joined (laughs) by jesse wilkins what's going on jesse well, if you do sever his head, Rob, you better give him one big blow to sever it in one, in one cut. What did you think I was talking about? Preferably get it done in one shot. That <laughs> doesn't sound pleasant, but significantly less pleasant or more pleasant than being tossed in a sewer. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, that was the torso killer uh, of Cleveland, not to be confused with the torso killer of New York. Or Pennsylvania. One. Or pencil. Why are there so many torso killers? Well, they we're going to talk about it, but they actually think that there's a potential that the Cleveland and Pennsylvania person were the same person. Mm-hmm. And that's what you alluded to at the end of that. I was sort just of chomping away at this documentary on the New York torso killer. I'm like, I'm getting so much good info <laughs> for this podcast. I'm so well versed, and then I found out it was the wrong one. Which yeah. what was the Black Dahlia, or was that none of them? The Black Dahlia was in L.A. It was Elizabeth. God, was it Elizabeth Smart? You're putting me on the spot here, but it was right. she was an actress and they found her body cut in half in a field in Los right. Angeles. So she wasn't technically a victim of a torso killer, but she was well, sort she of was torso. Killed. She did have true. a torso. <laughs> she did have one, that's true. Yeah, it was able to be cut in half. So they they think there are connections where they do tie her death back to the Cleveland ones. Because theoretically it could happen. It was like a 10 year gap or something like that. But I don't think they were related at all, to be perfectly honest. Mm. Yeah, probably not. And I I have a, a, a weird theory. And mm-hmm. it's probably an easily debunkable theory. But this this whole Cleveland torso killing thing, it sounds like a lot of it could have just been mafia hits. And the bodies were just dismembered and dumped. I don't it, think so. Why... Why does it have to be a serial killer? Why couldn't it have just been that? But on the flip side, Elliot Ness probably would have put that together <laughs> with his background. <laughs> so, Well, look at your victims because your victims, they don't really make sense as to why they would be mafia killings, right? Because it's a lot of women as well. So the mafia Maybe. is not going to be putting out this many hits on women at the time unless they like really did stuff that was bad and the people that we actually know weren't tied to any sort of mafia so i would say that it's not a mafia hitman Mm, yeah i did say it's probably easily debunked but it was something that crossed my mind you know you you think you hear about the body parts washing up it just seemed like a real mobster way to go right well i mean a lot of them weren't identified so they very well could have had mob ties true that's I mean, true. I still I still think it's very unlikely. I think if we want to get into theories on who it was already, I think the Dr. Sweeney theory mm-hmm. makes a ton of sense and for multiple, multiple reasons. In the episode, I hit on how basically 
as soon as he checked himself into a mental institution, the killings in Cleveland stopped. They just were done. And it seems as though he did, if it was him, those last two murders, he puts them right in the view of Elliot Ness's window, right? And he is almost taunting him there. For the rest of Elliot Ness's life, Dr. Sweeney is sending him postcards and letters taunting him. So that kind of ties together as well. And what I didn't mention in the episode is if it was him doing it, he was a doctor located very close to Kingsbury Run. So they think that was an easy way for him to get people in his house because he's a doctor. He's offering to help them or he's seeing them for problems. Maybe he's like, I'm a doctor. I'll see you for a reduced rate. I know you don't have a lot of money. And again, a lot of these people were unidentified. They were vagabonds, homeless, and he could have just been telling them that he would help them out of the kindness of his heart because he's a doctor. They go to his house and boom. Well, there's a few factors as well. So if he's a doctor, he's in the area already. He could also have these drugs that could basically render them paralyzed. Yeah. And they believe that this is how he was able to make a lot of these clean cuts because the cuts that they believe that happened when they were beheading, when he was beheading people and stuff, they don't think that these were post-mortem cuts and they think it was done in one blow. And how are you going to do that if it's a person who's able to defend themselves? So they right. think that he could have easily been drugging these people or he could have been severing their spine, which would render them paralyzed as well. Uh, you saw that in Wolf Creek. That was one of the ways that he had uh, rendered one of them to be paralyzed. So, But I think the likely scenario is he just had some heavy-duty drugs on hand, and I think he was in, he was using those to paralyze his victims before he killed them. One Wasn't of the bodies a- did have traces of uh, drugs in the system, but again, we're also dealing with limbs and stuff that are cut off, so it might have been hard to trace the drugs. Wasn't there a survivor? who was drugged but yep. got away and then woke up like two days later or something like that yeah i did attacked. i did read about that one he he went to dr sweeney's house thought he was drugged and took off so that's another thing that i probably should have added into the episode i was just trying to condense it as much as i could because it was already 15 minutes long and but probably a key detail i should have left it there was that situation that happened as well that is interesting you saw something like that with the jeffrey Dahmer case where at least one of the guys that got away was heavily drugged. And I mm-hmm. wonder if it was the same kind of drug that this guy was using. Yeah. And you, and you think to yourself, you're like, well, why didn't you go to the police? This, that, and you just kind of want to get away from the situation sometimes, right? You're just like, I just want nothing to do with it. I'm never going near this guy again. I am going to stay clear away from him. I don't want to see his face again. And you kind of do that, not thinking about what might be happening to other people after you. Exactly. I mean, maybe he just, maybe he didn't think he was going to get killed. Maybe he's like, wow, this doctor sucks. I don't know what the hell he gave me, but (laughs) you know, knocked me out for two days. I'm glad I got out of there. So yeah, maybe he didn't think he was a serial killer at a time at the time. Obviously when you have a case like this and you end up down the line, finding out that it was a serial killer, you're like, wow, you should have done this. You should have done that. But if you're in that person's shoes, he's like, wow, I'm just happy to be alive. Got away from that terrible doctor. Could have thought it was nothing. I also have a theory that whoever it was, oops, I don't think he was. Sorry, that That is the um, that is Sweeney, and I was popping it up. I didn't mean to bust it in right there, but I'm I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, That is a picture of Sweeney, (laughs) and he looks like a serial killer to me. (laughs) That was the point I was going to make. He's missing the glasses. They all wear the glasses. Yeah, Yeah. that's true. He He just looks like a deranged killer. He does. He has that. He has the eyes. It's the eyes, right? Like you, yeah. you see these here, the dead eyes. He has the dead eyes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. When you first pulled it up, I actually thought we were looking at a dead person. No, nope. <laughs> no, that's an alive person. So I think he makes a good candidate. I also think that whoever the killer was, I don't specifically think everybody was from Cleveland. I think they were using like the transients that were hopping trains, and he might have just been grabbing them. Like he knew that they were from out of town or something, gets them at the train station and kills them. And that's why a lot of them weren't identified. That's not a fact or anything, but it just seems 
it could definitely yeah. be a reason. I mean, they're also missing the head on a lot of these people. So you don't have dental records or I'm sure the fingerprint database wasn't great, especially if it's somebody from out of town, like you said. So mm -hmm. how are they going to do this, especially at a time where they're not communicating with other police departments, like you mentioned earlier. So it's difficult for them to track these down. Plus it's like when you had serial killers at this point in time, we mentioned this on a few episodes, it's like they can't, um, they just don't put out the possibility that the serial killer could have traveled from one town to another one. We mentioned that a lot in, uh, in for, like the man from the train in the Velisca episode. It's like these police departments didn't communicate with each other because it was just unheard of. They just didn't right. know. So you do wonder like how many of these guys were out there. Yeah. And the other thing, the, the one debunking of Sweeney as the killer is that after he went into the mental institution, the Pennsylvania torso killings picked back up um, for a little bit. So if it was the same killer for both of them, then it wouldn't have been Sweeney. Quick mm. uh, correction. That picture I showed was Dolezal, not Sweeney. So wrong suspect. Uh, I was going to say, I think the pictures I've seen with Sweeney have glasses. Yeah, Sweeney looks like uh, yeah, he's missing the glasses. <laughs> He actually has the uh, the glasses and looks like a doctor, but yeah. So it, it's the whole case. I've I've always like been drawn to this case, and as we look at a picture of Sweeney, he also has the dead eyes. Still no yeah. glasses. Still, Still no, no glasses. glasses. I think I have seen some pictures of him with glasses, but um, regardless, that's what he looked like. He has the dead eyes as well, so. Kind of. He looks a lot less like a serial killer than the previous guy that you showed. So that other guy, Dolezal, was that actually a serial killer? Or was that a poor victim that we just shamed into being a serial no, killer? No, that was the other person who was a suspect. Oh, okay. So might have been. Might have been a well, serial killer. Still has dead eyes. So he was the one that they brought in because uh, he lived with one of the victims for a while and he knew the other two that had been identified. So they brought him in because... He has a connection to all three, but as I brought up in the episode, everyone in this area knew everyone. They all drank at the same places. They all hung around the same places. People knew each other here, right? So they bring him in and they beat the bag out of this guy. He had bru He ended up killing himself in his jail cell and they did an autopsy on him and he had six broken ribs and bruises up and down his body. Yeah, that's another important, very important detail about this that you did not mention is that when he did kill himself, he hung himself from a bar that was five foot seven inches off the ground. He was five foot eight. Yeah. So, so he was determined. Well, or he didn't kill himself or that. And somebody else, the police might have had him killed because he was going to, he recanted his confession. Mm -hmm. Well, if, if you, if you wrap a rope or whatever, a bed sheet around a bar that's five feet, seven inches off the ground, and it's tight enough where the bar is on the back of your neck, then your feet are going to be several inches off the ground. That's true. But I, I do think it could be either way. I mean, we're talking about the police that beat the absolute shit out of this guy. That And th I found the confession rather interesting because they talked about how it had a bunch of like rambling in it, just incoherent rambling. But then it would be like, well, then I did this, 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 and this. I did it this way, and I did this, and I did this. Like, basically someone else wrote it or said yeah. it very yeah. clear that that he was being coached into what he was supposed to write and right. like he was clearly he had been tortured beaten yeah, yeah that you could just take this whole confession and throw it right out the window i don't think he was the guy right yeah I, nobody does so all the people that have studied this case are pretty sure he had nothing to do with it it just he was a fall guy i mean the town the city is scared they want results. The mayor wants results. The police department wants results. And this is what happens. They find a convenient suspect and they decide to pin it on that person. And that person becomes a scapegoat. The problem is you've just ruined somebody's life. You've, you've either caused them to take their own life or killed them. And guess what? He wasn't the person because the murders keep happening. So what do you solve by doing this? Yeah. Right. They're just trying to grab a guy. They hope it is him and they hope that the killing stop after so that they could just put a bow on it and call it a day. You see yeah. it in a lot of cases back in this time. There's I can't even imagine what the number of people that have been wrongly executed for crimes that they didn't commit is because yeah. it's got to be it's got to be in the thousands. You brought up Velisca. We saw it multiple times in that one with stuff that happened there. So it, it's just 
it's just out of control and it's just it's sad i'm sure it still happens today i'm sure it's not god we hope it's not as frequent right like you really hope it's not it doesn't seem to be no you can't beat a confession out of somebody anymore and when you do like it it just gets exposed in court so it's not just they get it everywhere yeah they don't get a confession and just take them straight to the gallows anymore. It's just not how it works. You so. got a guy on on trial for a murder. He's going to have a lawyer, a modern day lawyer. Mm-hmm. And if you're a if you're that's you're going to get acquitted if the police are beating shit out of you. So it's there, there's no the police aren't dumb enough to do that nowadays. And any any lawyer is going to just get somebody off with that. Yeah, yeah they're going to tear that up. I mean, you've seen killers get off because they didn't get read their Miranda rights when they got arrested. So it's right. yeah, that, that's a much more thorough legal system these days i'm sure there's there's still got to be a, a whole bunch of people that are in jail for crimes that they didn't commit but definitely not like it was back in the day definitely not like it was back in the day right so it, it sucks for for those purposes but these these killings are brutal like the mo of this killer and the things he was doing we we start with the lady of the lake which I don't understand. I maybe you guys can tell me what I'm missing on this. They she's not counted as one of the official murders of the of the torso murders a lot of times. I don't and understand I, why, because a lot of the facts that connect some of the other killings are they're very different. A lot of these kills, different body parts are missing. It really leads me back to believing that this is a surgeon who was maybe testing out different things on people. And the Lady of the Lake is one of these cases that lines up with this because hers, I believe, was one of the bodies that had this kind of reddish uh, tint to her skin as if some chemical had been tested on it. And then there was another body that also had that reddish. So why wouldn't she be counted in this? Like, What are the chances that two sick murderers are going to use the same kind of chemical agent? to tint the color of someone's skin it, it doesn't make sense to me and killing method right so like it's just it's for me those two things it's like clearly this is the same guy there's other deaths in here that i'm like skeptical of the one where they found the the woman and the in the sack they found like her yeah it's from her back skull, bones, right right it's like mm, maybe i don't know that could be but it also seems like it's not his real mo Unless it was like super duper old, like and everything had had decayed at that point. Yeah, it seemed like when he was first doing his kills, he did what a lot of serial killers do, which is they start off and they're very careful about where they put the body, how they do certain things to not get caught. And towards the end of this, especially with the Elliot Ness situation, he was getting a little reckless with his killings. And it seemed like he was just becoming arrogant, like you're never going to catch me. And man, the detail. Now, I don't root for serial killers, but the badass factor of just dropping a couple corpses right outside this guy's, you know, the, the lead detective's window, you got some balls, man. That is movie level stuff. Like, really if you, is. I'd be like, if I was watching a movie, I'd be like, he would never do that in real life. This dude did it in real life. He, mm-hmm. he dropped them out there. And there's, that can't be a coincidence. That's, the yeah, odds well, of that being a coincidence is so slim. You have to remember too that Elliot Ness did what any of us would do after that situation, which is burn down an entire homeless town. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what you got to do in that spot. And I think also like, solved homelessness. In the city. <laughs> <laughs> he actually he almost went into a berserker mode because he he burned down uh, Kingsbury Run, and then the local government had to step in a few days later because he was trying to burn down the homeless encampment. No, he was trying to circumvent the law and enter people's homes via checking uh, fire code stuff to search for evidence. This guy so, was pissed that those but, bodies got dumped and he went, he went full Clint Eastwood on him. <laughs> well, you go, you go from being like revered as like one of the greatest lawmen ever to kind of being made a laughing stock and i don't think it's fully his fault it's a little his fault you know you burn down all the the homeless people well that stuff is that's ridiculous. Just, that was the most ridiculous yeah. detail yeah that's ridiculous but i'm just saying like to get that put on him like 
he wasn't a homicide detective. He wasn't like versed in chasing serial killers. Just because you're good at one aspect of a job doesn't mean that you can be good at every aspect of that job or every version of that job. You know, there's probably great narcotics detectives that would never make a good homicide detective and vice versa, right? Because you just, you have the instincts and the knowledge and the experience for this other stuff and being thrown into that other version of the job just because you're a name kind of a shit spot for him, but he didn't help himself. He didn't do himself favors by burning down villages and keeping his portion of the investigation secret from the real detectives. How happy was the serial killer that the, the prohibition guy got his case. He's like, Oh, cool. I'm going to dump some bodies on your line. Cause there's no shot you're ever solving this one, buddy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well they they had their best detective in cleveland on the case too they said he was like a really really good homicide detective um a little unconventional but that he always got results so there was no one better to be on the case it's just they'll just you're, beat you into confession that's what i was gonna say was he the one responsible for beating people into their confessions? no that it was actually the sheriff's department that did that so it wasn't him mm. um but he i mean again you're dealing with a serial killer you're not dealing with a loved one that killed their other loved one you're you know so, sort of open and shut and this guy is as r- random as it comes right usually we see serial killers it's like okay well they only kill young white women or middle-aged men or you know it's there's usually an mo to these crimes this guy was murking anyone women men didn't matter it was whoever he could get his hands on white black doesn't matter he's killing whoever he can whoever yeah. he's able to i wonder if it's not as random as we think and i i feel like i go back to the doctor's office thing i feel like well, this yeah. guy might have been doing experiments on whoever he can get into his doctor's office and was just testing it out and it was much easier to get away with these crimes as we mentioned earlier if it's homeless or vagrants or just some sort of you know weary traveler that has no ties to the city what whatsoever and he's not going to be missed right yeah these are people who are communicating by writing letters home or whatever every once in a while or they have no home they have no family so it's it's easy pickings for someone like him and i i think it all goes back to uh the fact that all doctors are serial killers that's true right well that in fact a lot so many serial killers target lower class like the lower class because it's for that exact reason as people Mm -hmm. that they assume are not going to be missed yeah, and there was sex workers as well that he was targeting in this one. And you see that in a lot of cases, Jack the Ripper, just you name it with serial killers. It's just easier when no one's going to ask questions. Yeah, Albuquerque. Yep. Green River. Yeah, you name them all. That's what they go for mm-hmm. because they assume that there is no family. They're not in contact with their family. People aren't going to look for them. It, it. I mean, it all makes sense. It, it's just, it's sad. It, it's And it just sucks that this is what happened and that they weren't able to catch him. And the other thing that's like awful is the amount of kids that were stumbling on these bodies. Like kids are just finding dead bodies all over Cleveland for like three years. Different time, man. No Fortnite, no Nintendo <laughs> switches. You get out there and you find some dead bodies and some burlap sacks, Jimmy. <laughs> kids these days don't go out and play like they used to. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder why. Yeah, because they're traumatized. <laughs> My useless sons have found zero dead bodies. <laughs> They've solved so few murders. <laughs> there's, um, there's, did you guys hear about this one? This was an interesting one or an interesting part of this case. So right in like the height of the investigation where everyone's going crazy, the police department has hundreds of people on the case, detectives and various personnel and whatever, and they get a tip from a couple towns over in Sandusky, Ohio, that mm-hmm. a dog was found walking through town with a, a limb. It was a, a leg or a foot in its mouth. So the police, the detectives just put everything on hold and went over to Sandusky to, to get this limb so they can investigate it because they were like, it has to be, it has to be the same killer. And they got there and they found out that a dog had just gotten into like a trash bin at a, at a doctor's office where they pulled up. Uh, oh, and, so it was actually amputated. a it was an amputated limb, yeah, but it wasn't. Okay, so I give them more credit than the guy who thought he found a fish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I never seen no fish like that before. Oh, is that how they talk? It was just crazy how a, a dog almost blew this whole case wide open. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I bet um, it was just some, some husband who like his wife is always make fun of making fun of him because he's just like he's an accountant, right? Got to make fun of accountants. He's an accountant. He's sitting there. He's doing his books and he's never outside. He's not as an outdoorsy type, right? And she's like, why don't you just go fishing? Why don't you go farm? Why don't you get out there? Go outside, touch grass, get some sun. He's like, fine, I'll go fishing. And this is his first experience. Goes down the lake. He's like, well, look at that. A fish is already on the shore for me. You just Brings solved back a human foot. You just solved a huge mystery for me. My kids were on online the other day playing a game and they were talking and i he kept hearing them telling each other to go touch grass i'm like what the heck does that even mean oh you've never heard that no i've never heard that yeah it's people who are it's it's like the new insult you know i stay i'm pretty lit so <laughs> <laughs> no it touch grass is like someone who sits there and you know games all day and never goes out and touches grass yeah, oh, yeah. that's why you but, know what that means because you play yeah, video me. games and people yeah. tell you that all the time i've caught so many human feet by the lake all right was it a foot it was, uh, it was a footer. Yeah, it was the lower. No, it was the lower leg. Okay. So it was probably a foot, a leg, leg bone going on. He's like, "Is that a fin?" And someone's like, "No, I think those are toes." He's like, "What the fuck are toes? That's a fin." <laughs> you know, fish don't have toes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the other crazy one is the dude that was trying to like run and jump on the train, and he like trips, and he's like, "What the." Fuck? fuck did i just trip on he looks down it's just a torso like how shook would you be if you were like just running and you trip and you look back and you're, you're expecting to see like a bag or something and nope belly button just Jesus. all up in your face i would be indeed shook <laughs> you'd be so shook. like it's crazy. how many times in your life have you tripped over a belly button the answer is zero <laughs> that's why you were shook it's the first time anyone's ever done it yep so, yeah, just be, and it's just, they were found in so many different ways, like different random, different spots, like the woman walking her dog who just sees these uh, burlap sacks or whatever they were by the factory. She's like, she's too nosy. She has to know what's in them. She's like, ah, I wonder what, and she's probably walking by. I bet she even walked by it like two or three times, like going back and forth to see if anyone picked them up and then she's like looking around and no one's there so she finally just goes all right i'm gonna go look and she goes and she looks up oh, body parts all up in the bag well sort of she didn't know she opened it and it was just meat she's like these are cuts of meat. Sure. what is this doing here and then she went to the local butcher and was like i found these two bushels bushel baskets just full of meat or ham or something and uh, the butcher was like, that doesn't make sense. This is like the middle of the Great Depression. Nobody's just leaving baskets of meat anywhere. I said, right. let me go see this. So he goes and he opens it and he he's like, this is human flesh because they dug through it. And then they found, uh, oh. I think, like the lower half of a woman's torso in there Crazy. with it. So, yeah. Best part of this weird. case was uh, Detective Peter Mirillo. Mirillo. When he went. Yeah, when he went undercover, I don't know if you saw this picture, but this might be the worst undercover picture I've ever seen. It's going to be really small. I can't find a bigger picture of this, but uh, Rob, I hope you can. Yeah, see I've this seen, I've seen this play. picture. But basically, <laughs> the for, stiff. for audio <laughs> listeners, this is the worst undercover. Like, this is the most odd. This is obviously a cop. And it, so <laughs> what we have here, <laughs> what we have here is a terrible, terrible undercover image. Of this guy, he's still wearing his police uniform and fedora, but it looks like he decided not to shave that day. And he's got like a Bugs Bunny stick with the little bandana thing at the end, literally straight out of Looney Tunes. And this was him undercover trying to get, catch the serial killer. <laughs> Anyways, it didn't work. Did, didn't work. Shocked. Hmm. He reminds me. I went to a nightclub in Providence one time when I was like nineteen or twenty, and. I had this like 45 year old man approach me, clearly 45, clearly a cop. And he just came up to me, can I buy drugs from you? I'm like, <laughs> well, I didn't sell drugs. So no, but even if I did, I would have just, there <laughs> yeah, was no way I would have, I would have been like, uh, no, sorry about that, man. Clearly you're yeah. an undercover cop. That's what that's, that's what this guy's doing. So he's just walking up to somebody like, hi, fellow homeless people <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> would any of you care to cut my head off 
somehow it didn't work. Shocking, shocking that that didn't <laughs> lead to an arrest. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to cover this one because I just think that between all the different theories of who it could be, we probably have no clue. I mean, Sweeney feels like a good, a good guess, but the taunting thing just really, it really like leads me to believe it was him. Yeah. Like don't, don't, don't let me root for the serial killer here, but <laughs> I like it. I like it. So I guess these postcards, like there was nothing incriminating in them, obviously. So right. it wasn't like, ha ha, you could have caught me, but you didn't. I right. killed a lot of people. It was just more so like, just ramblings of kind of nothing, but the fact that he was sending the postcards was just such a middle finger. Like, yeah. What if, what if he wasn't the killer and was so sick of Elliot Ness accusing him of being the killer that he just decided to kill two people and then leave them in front of Elliot Ness's <laughs> window? <laughs> oh, there's another move there. Still wouldn't recommend it, but. Mm. Mm -hmm. One of the postcards he sent just was a picture of a police officer that was looking like an idiot. Like, so he was sending him oh, stuff man. like that too. So, troll. so just although troll. although if like someone tried to ruin my life, like if some detective was just like dead set on me being a serial killer, and you know never got any good evidence on me or whatever, because everything that that Elliot Ness got on this guy was just circumstantial. Like he just couldn't get a, a conviction out of it, and or not even a conviction, but he couldn't even formally charge him with the crime. Right? I don't think he ever right. got charged. Never got so. charged, and he never shared it with the detectives working the case. So his this whole situation didn't come out till years and years after that he was keying in on this Sweeney guy. It was like kept very confidential and the detectives working the case never knew. That was the problem. It's like, well, if you think you have this suspect, share it with the other guys working the case. They might have something that could help put him away. Right. Yeah. Like if you're like, well, this is the doctor we think it is. You gotta go, oh, well, we think that a doctor's doing it because of this. Let's let's cross reference that. Maybe they would have caught him if it was him. Yeah, I could have solved it. But in fairness, if he wasn't the guy, I I would also probably troll that like star detective who was just dead <laughs> set on me being a serial killer when I'm just not, you know. So I I would I don't know if it would be postcards in this modern day. Maybe I'd send him a tweet every, you know, every year on his birthday <laughs> or something. But yeah, I, I would I I appreciate a good troll job. So if he's not the serial killer, cool. And if he is the serial killer, I don't want to root for him, but still kind of a badass move. Happy birthday from def at definitely didn't do it. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> On Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Cleveland torso murder is one of the uh, bigger serial killer mysteries right up there with the man from the train, right up there with the Zodiac killer in my book. Another one we'll have to cover at some point, but just uh, find it fascinating because I find the police work and the suspects and everything fascinating in cases like this. Same. And it is It is interesting to see the evolution of police investigations over the history of the United States. It is, it is interesting. Yeah. And not even oh. the world, the world, really. Since this is hometown ghost stories, I feel like we should add in the fact that there is a little bit of paranormal tied to one of the items that came out of this case. Yeah. Yeah. So according to one of Cleveland's haunted websites, they believe that the death mask from one of the victims that uh, Rob talked about it in the intro video, they believe that that mask is haunted. It is on display in a case and they've had phantom fingerprints pop up on the glass and things like that. It's a terrifying picture. I, I'll probably have it in the opening portion of the death mask. So you probably saw it in the episode already, but terrifying, terrifying. Death masks are just terrifying anyways, right? It doesn't matter who it is. Mm -hmm. And this was of the tattooed man, which was an interesting person in this case because they were sure they were going to identify him. He had six tattoos. You know, at the time, sailors and criminals were the only ones that really had tattoos back then. So they were like, well, someone's going to know these tattoos. and. Then they put the death mask on display. Over 100,000 people see it, and not one person comes through and knows who this guy is. It's crazy. It's, I mean, it wasn't, I mean, it was a long time ago, but it wasn't mm -hmm. that long ago where people would go, you know, you'd figure it would be less common for people to go missing and then turn up and be unidentifiable, you know, just with 
missing people and someone's got to know something. And there was a bunch of them with this case. There was at least at least two, right? I mean, I think there were more, even three or four. That yeah, were just that were officially identified. identified. Oh, that were never identified. There were. I yeah. think there were more that weren't identified than were. No, there was eight that were definitely not identified. And the other thing that they, well, actually, sorry, nine that were not identified, two positively identified, and one they believe they know who she was based on her dentals, but they would never give it a full positive ID. And they think there might have been more murders. They think that just because we know about 12 doesn't mean that there was only 12. I mean, we're finding bodies in burlap sacks in the lakes, right? right. That are I'll washing up. What didn't wash up? Yeah, exactly. What about the ones that didn't wash up? Right. So there could have been even more murders. And that's kind of why I think some of the people were from out of town, like probably hopping trains passing through, because I think more probably would have been identified if they were all from Cleveland. Yeah, but you're right about that. That's just what I think. I mean, it, it can't, again, I could be completely wrong. And we're talking about bodies missing heads too, right? So it's a, it's a tough situation to identify them. Yeah, but definitely. Crazy, crazy story. Very much so. Anything else you wanted to touch on with this one? No, I just, I just, again, think it's one of the, I've always, I always go back to this case and read about it every, you know, year or two, just because I, I find it crazy. Like the, the, just based on the type of murders, not finding the person and, and just seeing that people were just out here cutting people in half, decapitating them to kill them. Scary stuff, man. It is scary stuff. The even scariest part of this is he looked like this. <laughs> <laughs> For audio listeners, this is a very poorly done sketch of him, but uh, that <laughs> I don't know if that was what he was described as looking as, but if so, then uh, he looks a little bit like Carrot Top from The Simpsons. Was it Carrot Top? No, Carrot Top's a different guy. Still looks a little like Carrot Top. Who's the guy from The Simpsons that has like the palm tree hair? Sideshow Bob. Sideshow Bob, yeah, that's, that's kind of what looks like in this image, but Anyways, for those of you audio listeners, you'll want to come over. There's actually, a I don't know how much of this you can or will include, but there are still a lot of crime scene photos from this case available online. I'm mm. currently on uh, clevelandpolicemuseum.org, and they have a few of like the decapitated, the heads that have been decapitated. Deca disembodied. Disembodied heads. His head <laughs> has been cut off, and they have pictures of it. His kappa was detated. That was the office line I was trying to come up with. All right, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Took a little while to get there, but yeah, there's a few pretty gruesome images. So if you're into that kind of stuff, go check that out. If you're not into that stuff, then don't visit that website that I just told you about. But there are still pictures available of this. It's a very fascinating case. And now I'm going to go watch. I'm going to go finish the documentary on the New York one because it was a really good documentary and I'm upset that it wasn't the right documentary. <laughs> maybe it uh, was. Oh, Maybe. Uh, so yeah, that's going to do it for me. Cool. All right. Well, uh, for those of you who are listening, thank you. For those of you who are watching, try to uh, do your best to subscribe on YouTube. You do that by pressing the subscribe button. You can get content just like this. And then you can become a member as well. The cheapest way to support the show, $1 a month. Cheaper than that is the free way to support the show, which is you drop us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We really appreciate that. Let's thank our patrons real quick. Uh, where are we heading on Tuesday, gentlemen? Oh, we're not heading anywhere on Tuesday. That's right. We're doing listener stories from around the country and potentially from around the world, depending on who decides to send us in stories. We are not relegating that to America. So wherever you are, if you have a haunted story that you would like to share, you can either drop it in the Discord on the Ghost Stories tab, your Ghost Stories. You could send us an email at hometown ghost stories. Doc, uh, hometown ghost stories at gmail.com or uh, just shoot one of us a message but please let us know that we can use that ghost story yeah so send them either way and if we have permission to share them then we will do that and yeah so our patrons are VIPs we have Allison V, Garrett, Jeannie R Justin T, Lisa J, Mallory K, Mike Oubliet, Blake, Mom and Pops W, Robert H, Stephen V and Demon King as well as Irish Assassin Gaming thank you so much for being VIPs we appreciate you guys we also have Ambie Rose, Anna C, Donna, I'm uh, sorry, Donnie N, Lily, Jake V, Janice G, Mar Fire, Matthew T, Papa Squatch, Rachel B, Sarah Cook, Stephanie A, Sydney B, Al Capone, Anthony T, Ashley M, Brandon W, 
Brennan B, Captain McSlugs, Cody G, Eric S, Huggy Bear, Joe R, Kiri Lee J, Mark M, Mariah M, Paul from St. Louis, Peach Smoothie. We also have Rachel B, Sarah R, Scotty L, Solar Flare, Soph, and Hooper. Thank you so much for being on Patreon. Early access to shows just like this, as well as ad-free episodes, bonus content, behind-the-scenes footage, all sorts of fun stuff, Patreon hangouts, movie watch-alongs. We do a lot of stuff for our patrons, and we appreciate you guys so much for doing so. Dave, why don't you land this old aircraft? That's it for this edition of Hometown Ghost Stories Dark Mysteries. We'll catch you next week. Peace. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Jesse Wilkins here, Hometown Ghost Stories. Hope you enjoyed that episode. For more bonus side content episodes, swing on over to Patreon. Get early access to this stuff, as well as some Patreon-exclusive stuff. For as little as $3 a month, you can join on Patreon and help support the crew. We put a lot of money, effort, resources into these videos, and every little dollar helps. So, consider it. Also, uh, swing on over to the Discord. On the Discord, you can get access to us. You can contact us. You can share your stories, share your ghost pictures. Uh, it's just a better way to contact us. So swing on over to Discord. The link is below. It is free to join, completely free. Also, here are some other episodes that you can check out. Boom. Boom. Check out those videos. Really cool stuff. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.